I want to encourage you all to become sound explorers. When you go and visit a place, I want you to take your headphones off, unplug your iPods, put down your digital cameras and listen for what you can hear because you may be amazed by what goes into your ears. I'll give you an example. I've been to Iceland a couple of times and on the south coast of Iceland, you get this glacier that comes almost down to the sea. And this glacier, obviously ice breaks off it gradually and it goes into a glass glacial lagoon. And you get these icebergs on this glacial lagoon which float out to sea and then sort of beach themselves on the black beaches of southern Iceland. And this is how one guidebook describes this place. Icebergs wash downstream to the sea. They, there they get stranded on the black sand beach making for evocative photographs. And that's how most guidebooks describe this place. And most people who visit it, they pull up in their coaches and their cars, they get out, they take a few pictures, they might go on a quick boat trip around these icebergs and they go on their way. But I was lucky because I was, I was actually cycling around Iceland and I was rather tired and it was the end of the day and we decided to camp by the beach. And when the noise of the boats and the traffic had gone away, we could hear this amazing sound because the lapping waves move the ice and you get the tinkling sound of ice being moved on the beach. And that accompanied our sleep and our eating by the sea. And this is what I'm trying to in, really interest in, is places which sound amazing. And I find it incredible that guidebooks just don't talk about these interesting sounding places. I mean, there are a few exceptions, and I'll give you a few of those. So for example, if you go to Pisa, and you go to the Baptistry in Pisa, which is a huge, great building, then every so often the attendants will walk into the middle of the building and sing a few notes. La, la, la. And those notes ring on the, in the space so long you get a musical chord. That's in guidebooks. If you go to Iran and go to the Imam Mosque in Isfahan, there's a huge dome ceiling made of those Islamic tiles. And guys will go there and they'll flick a bit of paper on the floor and you'll get a ricocheting echo between the floor and the ceiling, back and forth, back and forth. And again, that's quite popularly talked about in guidebooks. Or maybe closer to home, if you pick up a guidebook for London and look up St Paul's Cathedral, you'll hear a description of the Whispering Gallery. You go up the stairs in the Whispering Gallery and you get into this big circular space, not dissimilar, I guess, to here really, but you're at the bottom of the dome. And what you do is you, get, you stand at one side and a friend stands 30 metres away. They're quite a long way in the distance. And you whisper around the wall. And the sound goes right around the edge of the wall, skims the edge. And your friend on the other side, you know, it sounds like you're talking out of the wall. It actually sounds like the whisper is emerging from the stonework. So there are stuff that is in guidebooks. But it's actually, it's quite rare. And in some places, if you don't think about the sound, you're kind of missing out on quite a bit of the experience. I mean, this morning we had two people talking about being in the South, African, uh, South American jungle. And I've been in rainforests, not in South America. And if you don't think about the sound of these places, I think you're kind of missing some of the point. Because you can't see very far in these densely foliaged places. For indigenous people, the sound, the smell is incredibly important for understanding those places. But there's other places near from home which are where sound is also important. And if you don't think about sound, you miss out a bit when you visit. And I'm thinking there are prehistoric places like Stonehenge. And there's a field of archaeology called archaeoacoustics, which over the few decades has been saying, look, you must think about sound if you really want to understand these places. So a place like Stonehenge is 4,500 years old. And think back to the people who were building that. And think back to how important the vision and sound was to them. OK, vision was important. But sound would have been probably more important than it is today. They had no way of writing it down. They weren't making notes on their iPads or their phones. They were passing messages between them orally. So the ability to take in information orally, transmit it, was even more important than it was today. The play time was a much more dangerous time. So you're much likely to be attacked by other people or maybe attacked by predators. And if someone's going to attack you, if they've got any sense, they come up from behind. They don't attack you from the front. And what's your early warning system for attack from behind? It's your ears, because you can't obviously see behind. And if you look at some prehistoric sites, there's a real hint that sound was important to our ancient ancestors. 
If you find places with rock art, cave paintings, or, or paintings on the sides of cliffs, then you find they tend to be put in places where the acoustics is interesting. There's rock shelters in Australia which have Aboriginal paintings on, and if you stand some distance away from them and talk at them, it's like the person who's painted on the rock is talking back to you because of the echo off the rock. So we see, seem to be able to see that our ancient ancestors thought acoustics was important. So when you go and visit a site like this, it's important to think about the sound if you want to get the whole story. Not just to go there and look at the amazing visual feat and also wonder at how they constructed such an amazing site. But if you want to know the sound of Stonehenge, actually Stonehenge is not probably the best place to go and visit. Because although this picture looks quite complete, actually a lot of the stones are missing and a large amount of the circle is missing. And actually your best bet is to get in a plane and cross the Atlantic. If you go across the west coast of America, you'll find a replica of Stonehenge. It's built out of concrete and it was built just after World War I. And it was there, it's a monument to the fallen heroes in the Great War. And it's actually a really good replica in terms of the geometry of Stonehenge. Okay, it's made out of concrete instead of stone, but actually acoustically that doesn't make much difference. And there you can actually get back to what it would have sounded like when our ancestors, complete, ancestors completed Stonehenge. So I'm going to play some sound files, which I hope will give you a sense of what it's like. And all acoustic experts, what they like to do is when they go into a space, they like to clap their hands to hear what it sounds like. So you'll hear some hand claps. And the first few, maybe about six, seven, eight of them, are actually in an open field in the middle of nowhere. And then we'll switch the claps within the stone circle. Now, whenever you do an acoustic demonstration, one of the problems you have is you have the room we're in. So you'll hear the claps filtered through this room, and that can sometimes make the effects hard to hear. So I'll just give you some hints of what you should be listening for. The claps will get a bit louder. They'll change tone from a sort of a clap sound to a sort of frock sound. The timbre changes if you're a musician, you could think of that. They also last a bit longer. So this is what it sounds like. First of all, away from the stone circle, and after about eight claps, we then go into the stone circle. So that thwock sound is actually the reflections coming off the stones. And what's interesting is if you stand in this space, even though, as you can see, it's got a lot of blue sky in it, it sounds like you're in a building. Now think how remarkable that would have been to our ancestors. We look around us and all these buildings. We're used to having reflections off stone surfaces all the time. We're used to living in rooms and in buildings made of hard stuff. But structures like this would have been incredibly unusual in prehistoric times. That would have been a very unusual acoustic. And it's a really useful acoustic for holding rituals. You know, if you've ever talked outside, it's hard to communicate. If you actually get in a building, you get the reflections off the walls help you to talk. The same is true of the site of Stonehenge and its replica. The reflections from the stones make communications easier. And this is a ritual site. And what happens in rituals? Well, people make music. They speak. They sing. So we don't quite know what Stonehenge was exactly used for, but the chances are sound was made within the circle, and it's got a good acoustic for that. So when you visit a prehistoric site, if there's not many people around and you won't disturb people, I suggest you should clap your hands and sing a bit and actually hear what you can hear there and understand the acoustics a bit better. And I'll give you an example of that from a modern-day example. So this is uh, Richard Serra's work, which is in the Guggenheim in Bilbao. And I went round there one morning testing the acoustics, waited for when people weren't around me, so I wouldn't disturb people, and clapped my hands. And Richard Serra, did, as far as I know, didn't do anything to do with acoustics. He's a designed or sort of creative would be a better word, for completely other reasons. But they have amazing acoustics. And I'll give you the sound of a clap three times in one of these sculptures, the S-shaped one in the middle. And you'll hear how the clap, well, it doesn't sound much like a clap, and it's got this strange sort of warbling tone to it. So I would encourage you to become sonic explorers because I think there's things to be heard which are quite amazing if you, if you go around and make a bit of noise and listen out. But I'm also interested because I'm trying to document interesting sounding places. Because I haven't been able to find them in guidebooks, I'm trying to find them in literature. 
And what I find quite interesting, if you look at old literature, 17th, 18th, 19th century, I can find lists in books of echo locations, places where you get, you know, you, you get echoes back off. Finding a modern equivalent, well, I can't find one. People don't seem to note these anymore. So if I go back to the 17th century, then you'll find pictures of people who've drawn interesting paintings of echo sculptures. This is a Jesuit scholar called uh, Kircher, who drew these strange sculptures, which uh, I don't think were ever built. But his idea was each of those vertical panels creates a reflection, and this series of reflection then alters a, gives an interesting echo back. He was really interested in the idea of taking a phrase in, phrase in French, having these panels which, when reflected, would make you think it was in Spanish. So he was really into sort of playing around with ideas. As well as making these fantastical ones, which as far as I know were never built, he also investigated real places. And this is a, a villa in Milan, or near Milan, which became really famed for its echo. You can pick up old travel guides and you can find it being described. Famous mathematician Daniel Bernoulli actually went and measured the echoes here. Kircher had diagrams done of it so he could understand what was going on. And actually, if you look in the sort of right-hand top corner, I've just ringed it in red, there's a window. And it's a really odd place to have a window. It ruins the symmetry. Well, that window is where you hear the echo from. So maybe it was even designed, or maybe they put a hole in the wall because they found out about this echo they wanted to hear. So lots of people wrote about it. And one example would be Mark Twain, who had this uh, travel log called An Innocent Abroad. And he wrote about this place. And uh, this is his description. The guy took a speaking trumpet and through it she shouted sharp and quick, a single ha. The echo answered ha, ha ha, ha ha, ha 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 ha. And finally went off into a rollicking convulsion of the jolliest laughter that could be imagined. The description goes on longer to hear them letting off gunshots, and in the end, for some weird reason, the two gentlemen travellers kissing the, uh, the guide, which are, uh, and paying her a franc for the pleasure, I think, if I remember <laughs> rightly. So these, in the past, we celebrated places like this, and we don't seem to celebrate them anymore. And I'd like to rediscover that oral tradition. What's sad about this place is that it no longer has this interesting echo. It was very near railway sidings in Milan and was bombed very heavily during the Second World War. And although it was reconstructed, no one took care to preserve the acoustic properties. And so it now echoes only once and is no longer very remarkable. And so that's the other reason I'm interested in trying to document interesting acoustic places so we can preserve them, so we don't lose them in the future. But there's another reason why I'm interested in these uh, interesting acoustic places, and that's because my day job is an acoustic engineer where I deal with things like noise. And I actually think we need to start celebrating sound if we're going to deal with the problem of noise in society. So I could quote you a lot of statistics about how noise affects society. The fact that one in three people in the UK suffer from neighbourhood noise. The fact that hundreds of millions of people in Europe are, are, have noise levels above what the World Health Organisation recommends. But I don't think you need statistics to know that noise is a problem, because I would be surprised if there's anyone in this room who has not suffered, being woken up at night by their neighbours' television, by the dogs barking, by them slamming doors struggling in pubs and restaurants to hear yourself because the music is too loud, or trying to concentrate on a train while someone has a mobile phone conversation next to them in the quiet carriage. We've all suffered noise problems, so I don't think I need statistics to prove that. Now, over decades, acoustic engineers like myself have tried to make things quieter. And in a sense, we've succeeded. So if you look at a car from today compared to an old banger from, you know, from my childhood, each car is very, very much more quieter. But unfortunately, we have many, many more cars. So we haven't ended up with a quieter world. And I think if we're going to deal with noise properly, we need to do that noise control engineering, as we'd call it. But we also need to celebrate sound. Because after all, when you're listening, you're actually probably not making any sound itself. And actually, a lot of the noise problems that we deal with are actually about people being inconsiderate. The person using the mobile phone loudly on the train is being inconsiderate. And if we celebrate and enjoy sound, I think that's a much more positive message than telling people to shut up. Now, I want to finish quickly on a couple of sound places in Manchester, which you could visit while you're here. And um, just to give you a sense of where maybe in this environment you could go to find some interesting acoustics. Uh, and the first one, unfortunately, we've got a calm day, so you won't hear today. But if you're in Manchester when it's blowing a gale, do what I did. I was just about to go to bed at 11.30 at night. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was on Twitter, and suddenly you saw these tweets about the Beetham Tower singing. 
So I jumped in the car, drove down to the city centre, opened the sunroof and stuck a microphone out the ceiling. And uh, it hums. What happens is there's a top structure up here, which was put on purely for vanity, it seems, to make the building higher. But it, it whistles in the wind when it gets really windy. And in fact, it whistles so badly, in, back in 2006, it stopped a recording of Coronation Street nearby. <laughs> now, if you want to hear what it's like, we'll just play a sound file of what it sounds like. It's going, mm, it's a D below middle C, if you want to join in. Uh, and it actually, it actually, the tweets, people complain of being woken up by it. But unfortunately, you'll have to wait for another windy day to do it. It's done it quite a few times over Christmas, so you never know when the wind picks up. So let me also give you a place which you can reliably go to. And I went with an artist called David Tidoni, who went and showed, who does this thing where he goes around and bursts balloons and listen to the sound effects. And he talked about giving acoustic gifts. So this is my acoustic gift to you. And um, it's not a great picture, which is fortunate because David doesn't like his face and it's actually blanked out, so that will, that will do nicely. But uh, we got a big novelty balloon and we went round the canals of Manchester bursting various balloons. And this is actually at the end of Canal Street, so a uh, famous nightclub area. So some of the things on the floor, you don't want to repeat what was on the floor where I was putting my recorder. Um, <laughs> And what we did was we burst balloons. And this has got the most amazing acoustic, but it's quite subtle. And one of the things you find when you start to really get into sound is you start appreciating the subtle details. So this is going to be the hardest one to hear, probably. I'll play it three times, so hopefully you might hear it. But the thing to listen to is when I normally clap my hands in a room like this, I'll risk doing it. The sound sort of kind of dies away nice and smoothly. When it, in this space, it warbles. And that's what you're trying to kind of listen to, a sort of springy warbling sound as it decays away. It actually has an acoustic rather similar to a famous place in America called, called Echo Bridge, which has a very famous echo. So I'm going to leave you with the sound under a bridge. And if you want to get there and try it out, just go down to the canal and walk into the town centre and eventually you'll get there. <laughs>